An Epistemological Verification of First Principles. Hello and welcome. My name is Matthew Zimmerman. This is the semester project for PHS 611, Logic and Epistemology, taught by Dr. Yates at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. And so without further delay, I shall begin the presentation. What are the first principles? When observing reality, a frequent source of difficulty is that the appearances of the objects we observe do not, at times, accurately reflect the reality of what these objects actually are. This obstacle is overcome in epistemology and in philosophy by means of the first principles, by which the distinction between appearance and reality is surpassed. The first principles are self-evident, meaning that it is both impossible and unnecessary to produce evidence of their truth. All thought has its origins in the first principles. Indeed, states Kenneth T. Gallagher, the intelligibility of these principles is present in every judgment. In the realm of epistemology, one observes three first principles, the principle of identity, the principle of sufficient reason, and the principle of efficient causality. Each shall be examined in turn. And so beginning with the principle of identity, among the most intuitive epistemological first principles is the principle of identity which in simple terms declares that everything is the same as itself, that it is in unity with itself. The principle of identity emphasizes the fundamental distinction between being and non-being, between existence and non-existence. By extension, it also expresses the reality that a thing cannot both exist and not exist, at the same time and in the same way. As such, the principle of identity is an indispensable prerequisite for asserting or denying anything whatsoever. As is seen, the principle of identity serves as a universal metaphysical law which describes how reality is and remains consistent, uniform, and predictable. One of the earliest attempts to explain this principle was undertaken by Parmenides. In his effort to assert the identity of a thing with itself, he held that all change is an illusion. By asserting unchanging permanence in beings, Parmenides offered an explanation for the fidelity of a being to its own ontological reality. As is obvious, however, his theory ignores the fact that change is real and verifiable through observation. The apparent problem of change in relation to the principle of identity is addressed by referring to the existential import of this principle. Recall that it emphasizes the profound distinction between being and non-being. Any being, insofar as it exists, possesses ontological unity, which refers to the inner cohesion of something by which it constitutes an undivided whole. This inner cohesion of a being unites all its parts, such that it comprises not merely a chaotic assemblage of components, but rather a whole and unified being existing in the singular and identical with itself. Another way to visualize the principle of identity is through essence and existence, the metaphysical principles of which every existing being is comprised. Existence is the principle of similarity, by which a being is like all other beings, which also possess existence. The differentiation of one being from others 
is due to its essence, which distinguishes and separates each particular being from others, thereby providing a unique identity. Uniting with existence, essence limits or subtracts from this existence in an ontologically unique way in the case of each being. It is through this union of essence and existence that a being is furnished with a unique identity that is one and the same with that being. Founded on the differentiation between being and non-being is the principle of sufficient region, sufficient reason, which declares that the existence of any being must be accounted for or grounded by something which is able to move that being from non-existence to existence. This sufficient reason for existence may be understood as the adequate ground or basis for the intelligibility of a being. A being is unintelligible if its existence cannot be differentiated from non-existence. States Gallagher, if the absence and the presence of being are not identical, then where we have presence of being rather than the absence of being, there must be a ground or reason for the presence of being rather than its absence. If a being does not contain within its own nature sufficient reason or adequate grounds for existence, then this sufficient reason must be found in another being. Because the essence and existence of God are one and the same, it is the very nature of God to exist. He cannot not exist, and thus must be the sufficient reason for his own existence. In beings other than God, essence and existence are separate, and thus these beings do not possess in themselves adequate grounds for their own existence. This can be known because such beings came into existence, and thus at some point in the past did not exist. Because they came into existence from non-existence, their reason for existence cannot be contained within themselves, and therefore must come from another being. Put in metaphysical terms, a finite, contingent being must have its potential for existence actualized by something which already possesses existence in actuality. As is apparent, the principle of sufficient reason is connected directly to the principle of efficient causality, which declares, whatever begins to exist requires an efficient cause. Contingent beings do not contain within themselves sufficient reason for their own existence. Since every being must possess an adequate efficient cause, the efficient cause of these contingent beings must be something outside of and distinct from themselves. In other words, the existence of a contingent being is always relative existence, essentially referred qua existing to another. A being which begins to exist cannot be the cause of its own existence, because such a scenario would necessarily involve this being existing before itself, which is a contradiction. Likewise, if efficient causality were unnecessary in the process of coming into being, there would be no reason why beings could not suddenly begin to exist randomly and for no reason whatsoever. Thus, it is apparent that the principle of efficient causality maintains intelligibility in the realm of existence. The coming into being of various things does not happen in an unintelligible, random, or disordered way, 
but instead follows a coherent pattern by which existence is transmitted from beings which possess it in actuality to new beings which previously did not. In summary, beginning with the principle of identity, one can appreciate the nature of existence and the manner in which it is unmistakably and most fundamentally different from non-existence. Being does not exist in an unintelligible fashion. Its intelligibility is observed through the principle of sufficient reason, by which the very reality of the existence of a being is seen to arise as a result of an adequate factor which determines that there transpire a leap from non-existence to existence. The manner in which the clearly defined gulf between being and non-being is surpassed may be understood by means of the principle of efficient causality. God alone does not require an efficient cause, for his essence and existence are one. All other beings, however, do not contain in themselves an adequate reason for their own existence, and thus require an efficient cause in order to exist. In closing, it is only by assenting to and relying upon these first principles that reality becomes knowable to and meaningful for man. For the first principles are the epistemological foundation of all that man can know by means of his senses and intellect.